All right, Paleo Hackers, welcome back. Another episode, Paleo Hacks Podcast. And if you didn't know, we're on video. Been saying it for the last five calls, but this is new. I mean, this is probably our 16th episode on YouTube. So, you know, we're getting there, we're slowly making our way. With me today is Taro Iku. I messed it up, man. You no gotta worries, say it. Man. You gotta say it. Isokopula. Isokopula. Okay. Yeah. If he says it, then I can say it right after him. Um, over at Four Sigma Foods, and we're talking today about something that has been uh, kind of stigmatized over I don't know how many years. I mean, I, when I was growing up, mushrooms were either for um, cooking or they were for the hippies in the forest who were trying to get psychedelic out on them. Um, so they've been really stigmatized. So we're here today to kind of clear up some myths and uh, see how they apply to your life and, and what you can do to incorporate them. So Terrell, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Awesome to awesome to talk. So I guess um, right off the bat, let's jump into mushrooms. You know, kind of what are they? What aren't they? Um, do you agree with their them being stigmatized? Oh, a hundred percent. They're one of the categories that suffered from food racism the most. So I think same with bacteria. Like especially, I guess. We're somewhat same generation. We were scared of all kinds of mushrooms, but also scared of a lot of bacteria. And both of these groups are similar in the way that they're kingdoms. So I think there's been a lot of um, in nutrition health, there's a lot of binary thoughts. Is it good or is it bad? And there's a heavy emphasis on two kingdoms, animalia and planta, so animals and plants. And then there's the always the debate of like, how much should you eat? Is like, should yeah. the paleo be person high on animal protein or was it that they mostly ate crickets and and rats and small birds and whatnot uh but but i think there's not too often a conversation on what everybody can agree on like nobody's saying that dark leafy greens are bad for you and the same way is almost everybody can agree that a well-rounded diet is good and so these two kingdoms fungi which is you know mushroom kingdom and bacteria have you know been definitely stigmatized and and uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on the fungi part, but I always thought like it's it's been great to see also fermenting and other good bacteria yeah. and probiotics come up in the I mean, last even, few years. Even like insects too, you know. That's really oh, totally. Off. People are people are going crazy with the crickets, at least in Seattle where I'm at, and uh, you know, I yeah. see cricket protein bars and Whole Foods now, and uh, yeah, people are people are going nuts with that stuff, which makes Perfect. sense. I mean, you know, kind of exploring these alternative kingdoms if you will to the mainstream versus you know just plants and animals um, really branching out i mean it's it's got a lot of potential a lot of growth and stuff so how did you start getting into mushrooms and bacteria and, and everything you're doing now uh growing up at our family farm so we have a f- um i grew up uh near nokia finland you know like the phone oh, yeah. and so we have a family farm there and me and my brother are the 13th generation and um my dad is really into soil, soil health, and then my mom teaches, or taught, she just retired, uh, physiology and anatomy, and uh, my great-granddad helped to found this, like, environmental school, kind of like Steiner meets Waldorf, where I attended, you know, learning foraging, and, you know, we were eating uh, ants, we put a stick in an ant's nest, and we were eating that, so now I'm stoked to see cricket bars, uh, yeah. I really love this brand, like, EXO, and um, we also, fermenting is big in the Nordic country, so now... Now everything Nordic is super trendy with Noma and, and all that related, but that was not only the case. But then my real love has been mushrooms and especially these tree mushrooms uh, or medicinal mushrooms or inedible mushrooms. So there's different names for it, but mushrooms that really promote health and which are the kind of the more ancient form of, of, of eating mushrooms. And uh, But um, that's kind of where I grew up. I've studied chemistry and nutrition as well, but you know, growing up at the farm and then in a very cold Nordic country has kind of given me those. So you but, grew up foraging? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely in the fall, like mushroom season and berry season are huge. So what we do is pretty much every Finnish family, at least our family, we have huge fridges and we go and get like massive amounts of berries and wild berries, wild blueberries, or so bilberries, raspberries, but also different kinds of mushrooms, and then you just prep them for the winter because in the winter time there's not that much food essentially. Obviously, today's world we can just go to the grocery store, but if you want to get it, so that's a huge part uh, of our culture, just collecting wild food. Um, you know, so okay. And so, when did you really start seeing mushrooms and fungi start 
taken off in the United States? Has very recently? recently. Very recently. So let's say last two years. So I started my first mushroom company about 10 years ago. And, you know, it was def- <laughs> definitely not on the radar. Actually, I've now seen study data on the last, I think, uh, 60 years of consumption of different foods in the U.S. So overall, mushroom consumption has been growing one of the fastest in that, but not there's not been that hockey stick until lately. Yeah. And I think this whole paleo movement and the, the overall like umbrella of embracing some of these foods that have gone out of style or the things that are time-worn and actually are also very well scientifically backed. So be it probiotics or fungi are literally the most studied things on this planet from a Western science point of view as well. Those are coming back on trend. So I think people are more willing to look at mushrooms rather than just psychedelics uh, and, you know, the basic portobello mushroom that, you know, half of the people hate. So I'm, I'm ultra hippies, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what, yeah. What, what was your thoughts? I mean, I'm, I'm just curious on hearing like oh, on, 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 mushrooms. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of alternative podcasts and I've been deep in like the health community for four or five years. So I'm, I'm kind of like past the point of hearing people eat insects and being like, oh my gosh, I'm, an, I'm a stupid American. You know, like I can, I can only see plants and animals. Like I understand yeah. that people around the world eat all different kinds of things. And I think it's very important to look into alternative foods, especially if we're going to be feeding uh, 10 billion people, what is it, in the next 10 years or something like that. And then by 2050, we're going to have who, God knows how much. And so I think we have a a big vacuum that we need to fill with alternative food sources because clearly the way we're doing it with, like, monocropping and, you know, factory farming is just not sustainable. And so uh, this is a long rant to get at. I'm all for it. I'm, I'm very yeah. pro uh, insect. I'm very pro fungi eating, bacteria, fermentation, yeah, all that stuff. So to me, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. But I, I can imagine the person listening at home who is thinking, okay, well, how are mushrooms going to play into my diet? Yeah, l- l- let's set it up. So sure, I guess why should they even think about adding in mushrooms to their diet? Sure. So first and foremost, like understanding the fact that if something is a kingdom, there's always something that will kill you and something that will heal you. So there's plants that you will die of and there's plants that will be really good for you. Certain bacteria is bad. So same with fungi. And I think there's a lot of like, like very generalization is that mushroom. Oh, I have candida, which is a fungal disease. I cannot eat any mushrooms. And that is not actually correct. So, so there's a big group of them. And they generally can be divided for two purposes for health. One is nutritional mushrooms and one is medicinal mushrooms. So nutritional mushrooms, which are one of the more common mushrooms in the store, are you know, um, an alternative source for, for example, shiitake mushrooms are you know, full source of protein. Um, they also one of the better uh, sources of vitamin D. Uh, mushrooms actually create vitamin D. Um, there's certain iron. So for example, if you have thyroid or whatever, like there's certain minerals in them. So you eat them for macronutrients mostly, um, or a little bit of micronutrients. Then there's the other group. So these are edible mushrooms, which is the ones that you find in the store normally. And there's all the pretty much poisonous mushrooms are part of the edible mushroom group. And then there's the other group of medicinal mushrooms or inedible mushrooms. And most of these grow on trees. So decaying trees, um, and there's not really any poisonous mushrooms there. And that's mm. interesting is like huge part of pharmaceuticals are derived from fungi. So back to your question, why should you take mushrooms is because you are 30 to 50% same DNA. Depending on the mushroom, you are almost half mushroom. So you are extremely prone to fungal diseases like mold and candida. But you can also use mushrooms for your own health. And we can go later on what are the specific research back things. but. Okay. Like, in the 21st century, half of the best-selling drugs are derived from fungi. Whoa, okay. And four of them sell over a billion dollars a year. And so they literally, literally after probably tobacco, marijuana, coffee, like the most studied foods in the world Hmm. um, for pharmaceutical purposes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we derive a lot from them. I like the distinction between kind of the edible macro mushrooms that you can buy in the stores you can eat you know you pluck them whatever versus yeah. kind of the micro medicinal maybe not everyday kind of things like supplement supplemental uh mushrooms which would be more medicinal purposes and stuff so yeah um which ones then 
do you use? Do you use a combination of both of those? Yeah, so um, yes and no. So I would use both. I'm a little more cautious about the edible mushrooms because of molds. So there is like inflammation causing molds. So in the store and also the methods they're often grown. So unless they're wild, how they're grown in, they're essentially also mass produced. Hmm. So there's, there's reasons why I'm a little cautious. And it's really funny when you ask people about like the edible mushrooms, they're like, portobello mushroom, the butter mushroom, cremini yeah. mushroom. Yeah. They, so, so people could utilize those more. Um, but I, I, I'm fascinated by the other group because they possess properties and actually they are food as well. The medicinal so they're, ones? Yeah. They're, so they're categorized as a, as a general card as safe. They're a food and they were used in all throughout the year by varying them. So it's like greens. You should eat always some greens and you just mix and match them a little bit. So the same thing here. Okay. And I'm fascinated by them because they pro- possess properties that you, it's harder to get from other kingdoms because of the DNA similarity. They possess, uh, you know, good things for our health that I cannot supplement from other places. Whereas I can get stuff that I would get from edible mushrooms from elsewhere as well. You know? Okay. So. Yeah. 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 And so, when you see a mushroom in a store, let's just say you're in a conventional grocery store and you're pack or you're walking past the mushroom aisle with the big yes. giant buckets of like, you know, the brown one, the white one, and the black one. That's pretty much all the difference is the color. Yeah. What, what's going through your head? Is there like a lot of? Uh, well, in most cases, all the mushrooms you will see are actually in those that we talked about, the portobello and the the butter mushroom are actually just one mushroom. Huh. So there's one James genus. So. Um, I usually go for more of like mushrooms that are known for culinary purposes, but are also good for your health, like shiitake and hen of the woods, or also known as maitake. Those are great mushrooms that I take from from that aisle. Um, but a- again, it's like a lot of people just think that you can eat them, but actually, like commonly, they were used in soups and teas. So a lot of the mushrooms were used in a very different way than we we sometimes think. So. Um, and <clears throat> just uh, kind of back to the paleo thing, mushrooms were literally the first thing to come from the sea to the dry land, and pretty much all plants require mushrooms uh, to grow, and actually some animals are, love mushrooms. So there's even a funny BBC documentary on reindeer stripping on, on a mushroom. So, uh, but yeah, so I would look for the shiitakes and the maitakes, for example, in that aisle. But, you know, they, unless you have fungal disease... Mm-hmm. would like candida you should then you shouldn't eat them but otherwise you can just like try them out like vegetables like consider them like vegetables good source for certain minerals not too many you know calories so you can eat and match them and eat and enjoy variety and that variety is probably going to be good for your health so you said we were we shared dna with mushrooms i know they're also like 90 percent water correct yeah so there again there's down to different types of mushrooms so not all of them are so for example, the inedible mushrooms, which kind of the name already implies, you cannot eat them. So they have this chitin layer, chitin layer. Mm-hmm. It is like one of the hardest substances on earth. It's like the, I think the lobster shell is made out of it. And we cannot eat it. So it's like hard. It's like wood almost. Like it's hard wood. It's like bone marrow. And then you cook it the kind of the same way as bone marrow in slow, like longer time periods, 12 to 24 hours. And, and you extract from the heart substance, the things that are actually good for your health. Or you put it in alcohol and you extract it through that. So it's very or, specific by the mushroom, what you have to do to consume it. You can't just go willy-nilly out in the forest, pick every yeah. mushroom, throw it in a stew and call it a day. No, no. But here's my tip. is like almost the same as with, with some of the vegetables. Is My biggest tip is use fats. So a lot of the health beneficial bioavailable compounds are fat-soluble. So there's a reason why the top chefs would chop the hen of the woods and throw it with butter. Yeah. And not only it will open the flavor, it will be flavorly much better. It will okay. also unlock a lot of the health benefits. Or if you do a soup, you, mm-hmm. would add, <clears throat> you would add fats to it and then cook it. And those two would be great combinations. So actually a lot of the indigenous ways of preparing food is actually very much aligned with how things are made by available in modern day world. Okay. So. Okay. And um, so... Uh, one of the biggest stigmas with mushrooms is that it always has a connotation that they're poisonous, right? Correct. You're walking in the yeah. forest you're, as a kid, and your mom's like, don't ever eat anything off the floor, don't ever do, at least in America, don't yeah. ever do any of that, blah, 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 mushrooms are poisonous, you can keel over and die. 
And so I think yeah. a lot of people have that in the back of their minds that they're, they're scared to eat them. They're scared to eat the mushrooms. They're either unclean or they're fungus or whatever, or they're poisonous. So touch on that. Are, uh, are mushrooms so, poisonous? Yeah, so I, I can touch upon it from two angles. So first one, the foraging angle that could also include plants and other things. So from that angle, you can, you can make an argument that actually the food that we think it's safe in the grocery store is the you know killing us. So United States, <laughs> one of the biggest reasons of death is dietary related and the things that we eat in the store is literally killing us. It's just a slower form of death, right? Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people have outsourced their health and their connection with nature. So where their food comes from. And I'm, so I'm so happy about this whole farm to table movement. And I think the next level, once people get comfortable with that and like the whole local movement, they will get comfortable in foraging. And you literally can forge anywhere. I was just in New York and you can go to Central Park and forge food. Like you can get all, you never have to buy tea. You can get all your tea requirements at like these parks. So in that point of like from a forging point of view, that's a huge educational aspect and how we just like essentially domesticated the human species. And we have to kind of get gradually a little wilder again and get in touch. Now from a mushroom point of view, just like plants and actually some animals as well, like the blowfish, the fugu in Japan, they, they can be poisonous. And that's just the name of the game. And actually, if you look at toxology, everything is poisonous and nothing is poisonous. So it's this uh, father of Western medicine, Paracelsus, who kind of invented the toxology. He said that. Like, that's a famous quote about that. What, what does so, he mean? Everything's poisonous and nothing's poisonous? So essentially, mm-hmm. you can eat too much spinach and get anti-nutrients and, and get really sick. You can eat drink too much water. So it's about the dosage. So... Um, so there are certain nervous toxins if you take them, like Botox, I think that's yeah. like a modern version of it. So it's, well, it's, actually, like, it's like, it's like snake venom too. I mean, you know, exactly. the, the cure for being immune to snake venom is snake venom. Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So actually if you have fungal disease, that's a, that's a great metaphor for a lot of things in nature. If you have a problem, usually if you have a liver problem, eat liver. <laughs> if you have, if you have a fungal disease, you need to eat different kind of fungi. But to the point is that definitely there is toxic things. And there is like two actually lethal things and things that will just make you kind of bad. Um, the funny part is that almost all of those mushrooms are the ground mushrooms and the tree mushrooms. Unless you find a tree mushroom that is glowing in the dr- dark, you know, otherwise you're always safe to take it. Some are a little bit more health- healthy for you, but none are really poisonous. On the tree? On the tree, it's always Correct. pretty yeah. much good? But okay. otherwise... Just like get a local book or go with someone who's a local. The, the poisonous mushrooms and, and safe mushrooms vary per region. So yeah. if you're in Northeast or Pacific Northwest, just Google, go Amazon there and take a, like mushrooms in Northwest, you know, okay. something like that. And you'll get from that ecosystem the type of mushrooms you can you take and, you know, and start from there. See, with the foraging movement, like I'm all for it. I love the farm to table. I love yep. going out, picking my own berries. I feel very confident with that. But one thing... I've never felt confident with in the Pacific Northwest is forging for mushrooms because they have that poisonous connotation to them. Totally. I, I feel like I'm going to be that kid and in, uh, into the wild and crouching my stomach and keel over in my little camper van. But uh, wasn't that berries though? I yeah, mean, yeah. I think it was a plant or something. Yeah. I don't know. Which yeah. apparently didn't even happen in the book. They threw that in for the movie. I don't know. Yeah. I never read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> story, like, story of yeah. my life. Watch yeah. the movie, not the book. Yeah. Um, so with foraging, then. Yeah. Like, you know, I so I'm in Seattle, and there's got to be some mushrooms. Green amazing, mushrooms. Amazing. Really? One of the best places on, like, it's really amazing really? for foraging overall, but oh. for mushrooms especially. So, so, what kind of websites can I go to to figure out if one's poisonous or not? Um, I used to live in in Vancouver, Canada, and yeah. there's few people who will take you for forging tours, and I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that's the same in Seattle. So if, I would recommend going with someone and learning like two, three mushrooms that you are easy to find, yeah. and you just take them. Now, the other part is get focusing on the tree mushrooms, and there's a couple of mushrooms that are really easy to spot. I think almost all around you can find turkey tail, and really easy to spot, and there's like one lookalike, but it's it's safe. So it's not really easy to find. So you choose few mushrooms and you start with them. Okay. So it's like sometimes we like this Western society is when we start to do something, we have to be the best in the world, and we forget that like our whole educational system is based on grades. So how can you jump from grade one to grade like university immediately? Of course not. So like start yeah, work with, your like, way up exactly, and and just enjoy the journey. So finding one two mushrooms. Um, and, I mean, you can find them pretty much 
Mushrooms are extremophiles, so you can find them in Antarctica, you can find them in the nuclear reactor of Chernobyl. They grow everywhere, everywhere, everywhere there's plants as well. But um, places like Pacific Northwest or Northeast are particularly good for mushroom hunting. Because they don't need sunlight, correct? No, they don't. They don't, and, they don't photosynthesize, right? No, and a lot of them actually, you know, almost thrive in extreme conditions. So usually, like, the most healthy nutrient-dense foods are one of, the extre- one of the two other extremes. So both with mushrooms and plants and others is actually with animals as well. Is like either they grow in extreme lush environment in the rainforest where there's, like, gazillion types of birds shitting on and, you know, making the biodiversity and there's a, you know, all that, or they're super extreme. So they grow on very harsh climates. So a lot of the medicinal stuff actually grow on very high altitude or they grow in climates that are rough during the winter. So that winter will kind of prepare it for um, the nutrient density. Okay, so with foraging then, let's just say someone in America, let's uh, northern region, so top sure. half the country right now listening to this call, they want to go out foraging. They can look for people in their area to take them foraging. They could get a yeah. book. But you said that it's mostly, it's pretty much 100% safe to just find mushrooms on trees and eat them? Yeah. And do we have, it, to, do we have to cook them a certain way or eat them raw, grind them up? No, you can eat them raw. So that's the one thing is even the raw foodies uh, yeah. out there, you know, even the top raw food people will eat these mushrooms, but they will eat them cooked. So think of them as grains or think of them as certain vegetables that require processing so either you have to choose the heirloom variety but you also need to process them in some way so for example just focusing on the king and the queen the king of mushrooms is called chaga c-h-a-g-a or the queen called rishi r-e-i-s-h-i so things like that and you just look into for those two or the turkey tail i mentioned and and those are essentially have the two kinds of compounds, water-soluble compounds that you get by cooking it. So you cook it in a, in a soup or you cook it just and use the liquid like a tea. And that those are contain some of the most studied compounds for our immune system. So they're good for our immune system if the immune system is low, like when you have a flu or cough or even worse, you know, hopefully not, but cancer. Or if you have a hyperactive immune response, so some people who have autoimmune disorders, so mushrooms are one of the only things that modulate the immune system up and down. So that those things will come out when you cook it. You can also put it in alcohol tincture or you can have like an oil infusion. So use oils to get the fat soluble compounds. And those compounds are adaptogenic. So they help your body to adapt. So for example, common with paleo people and crossfitters and whatnot is cordyceps mushroom, which is shown to increase oxygen intake up to 15%. So that's an example of a property you wouldn't get by eating just protein is things that improve blood circulation and oxygen intake. And those are, you tend to be most commonly fat soluble compounds. Okay, so someone uh, who's listening right now and they're like, great, these guys are talking about foraging, they're talking about mushrooms, but like, why <laughs> should I consume them? Is it going to give me yeah. any sort of magical uh, health benefits? Or, or like, what, what would they feel if they started consuming mushrooms, let's just say every day? So on an everyday basis, um, mushrooms are the most studied for the immune system. And I think immune system is kind of not understood as well. The same with bacteria. We didn't always understand why the gut was so important because it was like, it's like a third element that we just didn't get. The same yeah. way a lot of the immune system comes from the gut and a lot of these mushrooms contain these polysaccharides, especially these BTD glucans that get absorbed in the gut. But the best way I can example is explain it to an average person is like who's never heard of them is like your body has these internal security officers cops if you may and they're protecting you against intruders bacteria viruses whatnot sometimes they take a vacation or their cop car runs out of gas or sometimes they their car is driving too fast and they're attacking your healthy cells so what these polysaccharides are essentially is the right type of fuel for that car And so they can drive and protect your body. And a lot of people only focus on their immune system when they get sick. And that's that's not a very good model. So multiple different body functions from your brain to your muscle growth, inflammation are related to your gut and your immune system, including allergic reactions. Um, So there's multiple benefits, but mostly just to stay healthy and keep a consistent part. And then some mushrooms have, like I mentioned cordyceps and reishi and chaga have, very specific special skills like lowering stress or um, lowering inflammation or including oxygen intake, but 
in general, mushrooms are good for your immune system okay. as a whole. So you can you can kind of do some prevention with it. It sounds like correct. I mean, um, like the most famous mushroom drugs are like penicillin. Uh, yeah. So they tend to be almost all antibiotics are derived from fungi, statins. Um, a lot of cancer treatments recommend well, even like Chinese medicine. I mean, they've been using correct. it for yeah. centuries. I mean, it's for for when you go to. I mean, Oriental cultures are. Yeah. In some ways, way more paleo than we are. You know, with the, we talked about the crickets. Yeah, you know, you go, Yeah, you go to like Thailand and, and people are popping grasshoppers and whatnot. But yeah. uh, same with mushrooms. Um, they're a little bit more tuned with that. So. Okay. Okay. You know, so we've kind of gone over why someone should consume them, consume them what they can be feeling, uh, kind of what they are, and um, almost a little how-to with the forging. Yeah. We'll touch on the how to in a, in a little bit, but I still want to nail down some things while we're just talking about mushrooms in general. And um, what other myths do you see floating out there? I mean, I know you grew up on a farm, you grew up foraging, you've been in this space with mushrooms. I'm sure when you go to a cocktail party or anything and you tell people you work with mushrooms, you get yeah. a lot of common responses and a, uh, you get to see the myths firsthand when you answer all the questions. Totally. So what kind Is of that- myth, myths do you see? It's good to go to cocktail parties because when you say you're a shroom dealer or yeah. sometimes I say I work for mushrooms, it's really, you know, it pees with people's... Either they get two reactions, and I guess you touch upon it on that intro. Either they get really spooked out, like, ooh, dangerous, or they taste bad, or they get super excited and they start sharing their college experiences. You're like, yeah. we, <laughs> we went on spring break, Alabama, yeah. whatever. It's one time in the desert, Burning Yeah, man. exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's one myth, is like it's either or of those two. And there's like 1.5 million types of estimated to be different kinds of mushrooms around the world. So driving into those like psilocybin and and portobello is a pretty limited view of the whole thing. So that's Mm -hmm. one. The other part is that, you know, mushrooms taste bad. It's same way as different plants, different mushrooms taste different. And some of them could taste exactly like chicken. So there's like a chicken of the woods or lobster mushroom. And the name actually comes from the fact that it kind of resembles the flavor there. Um, so flavor is one. And then uh, I think a very common one I th- is like I, my diet doesn't allow mushrooms because I have fungal disease and I think we partly touch upon that as well as like sometimes the best for the venom is the venom. So you take in these three mushrooms like reishi, which are actually antifungal. So the cosmic giggle here is that these mushrooms are actually anti-mushrooms and they help with people who cannot take mushrooms. So there's a set of di- diets that say you shouldn't eat mushrooms. And for those diets, it's actually pretty incorrect. And they're just focused on one aspect of the mushroom kingdom. So those three might be the most common myths. And then eating them raw, especially a lot of the mushrooms will not have bioavailability. So the whole raw mushroom eating is, is such, a, such a bummer. You know, it's like yeah. not only not from health benefits, also from flavor. I don't know who enjoys raw mushrooms and on their flavor. I think they're pretty awful. But when you cook them in butter, they become pretty, pretty delicious, you know? Yeah. No, for sure. So, um, being the mushroom king over there, you know, you said you grew up foraging, eating mushrooms your whole life, and uh, starting mushroom companies. What do you do then in terms of mushrooms? Like, break it down on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. What's kind of your mushroom routine? Assuming, you know, diet's taken out of it and we're just focusing on Taro's mushroom consumption. Sure. What does it look like? Well, Obviously, having the companies, I, I get access to sometimes pretty experimental things. But just for the sake of the pod, I, you know, we can focus on the more accessible ones. So um, <clears throat> I look at from more like how can I make my life easy without sacrificing anything. So I look at from more principles of adding good stuff in and replacing habits. So that's why I said the nutritional mushrooms are more of a culinary treat every now and then. Because I can get a lot of those same compounds from other foods in the plant world, for example, or you know, certain animal products. So my focus is really on finding the compounds that don't exist in other food groups that well, such as a mushroom called lion's mane, which is one of the only foods that are shown to help prepare and protect nerve cofactors. So I drink, like right now I'm having a a, a butter, dandelion, chaga mushroom, lion's mane combo. Piglet mug. Yeah, exactly. And the other one, other side is, is Winnie the Pooh. You know, you got to have your soft side, man. So, so, Not me, man. I, I got the gun mug. Oh, look at you. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah. You know, 
you know, you can easily tell who, which no. one of us is the alpha. <laughs> yeah, the, no piglets on this one, man. <laughs> no, no, totally <laughs> Let me tell not. you something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The American so, bug, yeah. Totally. Uh, so, so, essentially, I take these mushrooms such as uh, Chaga Lions, Maine, and things like that, really almost like, I guess, like the whole biohacker scene is pretty close to what I, how I perceive it. But I always take one or two mushrooms per day, and then I rotate them. Because even they all have these polysaccharides, which are a food, so you need to take them on a daily, constant basis. They're slightly different. So, so mixing and matching is good. So I usually always add one to two, either to my warm drinks or mm-hmm. to the basis of my smoothie. So these, I almost only drink mushrooms, which sounds even odder for a lot of people. But I use them as a base for most of my drinks, be in liquid form. And, and that's like, they're kind of like boosters for that. Um, and I usually take them twice a day. Um, I usually take them in the morning for more cognitive function and preparing for that day if I'm traveling. And then there is uh, the queen of the mushrooms, Rishi, and a couple other things that I use in the evening to really calm my body down and help break down stress and just like relaxing. So it tends to be in two sets, um, that I take them early morning, evening, um, but if, if in a certain training regimen, I would take some mushrooms to improve my physical performance. But that's a, there's other ways of doing that as well. So. Do, you, do you mostly get your mushrooms that you take from online sources, from your company, or from uh, foraging? So I'm spoiled. You know, It's like <laughs> I get all of the bobs. So obviously, I use our own products every single day. Um, I mean, but that's, you know, beyond that, we also get sent samples Hmm. Uh, from other brands, you know, they want my opinion or they, they're doing a new brand and they want to help and they, they have this source and the, what do you think of this? So I get excess of that. But also whenever I get the opportunity to go get some, uh, you know, some of my old, own mushrooms from the forest, that's special. You know, it's like there's more to that than just it's, – it's a little more work, but it's, it's, like a, it's like a hobby. It's like a lifestyle. So yeah. Okay. And um, what sort of resources do you use or, or follow within the health community that you're a real big fan of? Any people or books or um, shows or anything like that? Sure, a lot. I mean, definitely. So maybe like on a high level, I would say never outsource your health. So like whoever, like however smart somebody is or what a good source it is, like never outsource it. Like what works for you might not work for you know, some other person. So also don't preach your own thing too heavily for other people. So that's my kind of my guiding principle. But as far as, um, I think I've, I've studied nutrition and I've hang around a lot with nutritionists. So I, my common principle is that by at large, they're really lost. So doctors and nutritionists are really lost. The most I've ever learned about food and health and wellness tends to be from people like chefs and then farmers, and for different reasons. So I really, really enjoy spending time uh, with those two groups. And what, obviously, what depends, was the first group? Um, chefs. Oh, chefs. Okay. And how they combine flavors, and how they make food fun, and also other factors of foods, and just like using as a f- fuel is I just find fascinating. And also how they use fresh ingredients and that whole thing, it just fascinates me. Yeah. And without going into name dropping, you know, um, you know, I try to learn from, (laughs) so I try to learn from, from everybody. Um, you know, so, okay. Attend conferences. Cool. Cool, man. Um, so four Sigma foods, how did you get behind them? Um, is that your company that you started? Yeah, yeah. So I founded that about three years ago, mostly based out of Finland. And then um, last year, end of last year, we moved the, the business to the U.S. to, you know, accelerate our growth. And, you know, we're sold in 25 countries and whatnot. But our focus is that now that uh, and we brought it to the U.S. to help with, obviously, it's, it's the country that needs probably the help the most with nutrition. But our point is, like, really to popularize the consumption of these mushrooms. So instead of you cooking it for 24 hours, we pre-cooked it for you. But also combining with because a lot of the really good mushrooms are extremely bitter so we're doing things like mushroom coffee mushroom hot chocolate so think of like an upgraded swiss miss or upgraded starbucks via or whatever where we hide the functional mushrooms in mm-hmm. so you don't have to sacrifice anything in your current lifestyle to make it accessible for a larger group and the cost is like less than a 
you know, coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. So, like, that's the mission we're in uh, as far as that company goes. Okay. And so, uh, a while back, about a month ago, you contacted me and sent me some some guys. I got this one right. Let's let's talk about them real quick. I got this guy right here. Um, you got the, what is that, the cordyceps one? Yeah. Right? So, so that's the most sold mushroom from the medicinal mushroom groups in the U.S. Not our product, but in general from all the different types of mushrooms. Very common with athletes. Um, um, how it became famous is essentially through endurance athletes, runners, and others that increases oxygen intake to up to 15%. So you don't necessarily need sugar or caffeine to feel more energized if you get more oxygen into your lungs. All, it's used in the oriental countries for a long time for adrenal glands, so adrenal support and, and also asthma. And then um, part of the cordyceps family is a derived, uh, uh, essentially a drug called Gilenia from Novartis that is the only like official cure for MS disease, really. So it's used for those purposes. So it's, it's mostly for natural energy by increasing oxygen intake. So that's why it's popular because a lot of athletes who are more savvy about the latest and greatest, like things in health and wellness, they heard about it first. So, and people don't connect that with mushrooms. Yeah. And, and some people Google cordyceps and they find this gross video of another cordyceps entering an ant and then they're grossed out. But it's actually, this is like super safe. That's like yeah. a big, it's a, it's essentially a vegan cordyceps that people always buy. Is so. the cordyceps mushroom the one that enters an ant and then it explodes? Is that the yeah, one? Correct. Yeah, correct. Oh, that yeah. one's crazy. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, isn't it? So it's the mushroom that infects an ant, makes the ant go crazy and basically takes it over. And then when the ant goes into the uh, hive, it explodes and then infects the other ones. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Not just ants though. Ants are actually pretty rare, but also different kinds of spiders and moths. So humans, different kinds. No, okay. Humans not. Even though there is a very popular video game where where they claim that, but that doesn't happen to humans. So every there's I think like something like over six hundred different types of cordyceps species, and they constantly find them more. And every one of them will only attack one specific animal, such as one type of an ant or something like that, huh. and not affect anybody else. And um, but they've been used over two thousand years, um, you know, okay. safely for humans. So okay. Um, what about your mushroom coffee? So this guy right here, uh, uh, this one's the Chaga yeah, Cordyceps so, one. So essentially, um, like I said, the bitter flavors of the mushroom, some people, a lot of Westerners don't eat bitter. So coffee is one of the only bitters people like, and they yeah. drink it throughout the year. Coffee is really actually great. It's the highest source of antioxidants in the Western society. So our biggest cause of death as far as diet and in general goes is, is, uh, hard, um, and va- you know, vasculatory, sorry, my English is not my first language, but heart disease and blood circulation related. So having the antioxidants, because we don't really eat vegetables, getting them from coffee is actually vital for our nation's, you know, the nation's health. Yeah. So um, coffee is great, but it has two major downfalls. One is that it's extremely acid forming, and then people have problems with that. And the other part is that it, it will, because it's a stimulant, it will essentially eventually drain your adrenal glands. So just like drain you out and just you get like, oh, super tired and whatnot. So what's interesting is during the Second World War, when there was a lack of coffee beans, this king of mushroom chaga, which is extremely high in antioxidants, was used as a coffee substitute because it looks exactly the same and the flavor is a little bit similar, a little bit milder. And we've been doing for years, like putting half and half, so half chaga, half coffee, and people have no real understanding that the flavor changes. Is that what they, this is? Is this half and half? Oh, it's, it's more like third, third, and third. Um, but essentially, oh, yes. Like, yeah. Um, so using chaga to lower the acidity and then, like I said about the cordyceps, it's used for adrenal glands and energy without the stimulation. So combining those just three ingredients mm-hmm. is like a simple way of upgrading or replacing your coffee habit uh, without, and you still get, because coffee is great for also neurotransmitters, because it's like the flavor just, like sometimes we, if, if, if I'm driving on the road, I got that actually from my friend. And you cannot find high quality coffee and you only got like this awful Chevron coffee. Yeah. Just buy the coffee, put it in your car while you're on a road trip and just put the AC on and internally in the car and you just smell the coffee. And just by smelling coffee beans or coffee can actually trigger some of those things in your brain and you like feel more alert, which sounds really odd, but that's how we kind of wired our brains sometimes. Fascinating, man. So uh, what's the plan then with Four Sigma Food? Do you guys, are you guys in stores or... Um... Are yes. So where can people yeah. find you? We started, like I said, this year we started uh, with Whole Foods, Sprouts, um, 
they're, they're an outfitter, sell some of really? stuff. Yeah, but probably the easiest way is just log into one of the online stores, our own website, foursignalfoods.com, Amazon on Prime, uh, Thrive Market, Lucky Vitamin. So any of those are probably the easiest ways, depending obviously where you guys are tuning into this podcast. So, but if if you're in the you know in the bigger cities, you might find them some of them on the retail. But online is probably the safest bet. Awesome, man. And what about yourself? Do you have a website, or do you work mostly just through Four Sigma Foods? Can people find out more about you? Yeah, probably Instagram. I don't have Facebook. I'm kind of part of my French, but retarded with this whole online thing. But I, I have an Instagram, and it's my name, and probably you can put it on show notes or something like that. And so um, you can find me on lectures and stuff. I like to meet people in person, and you know, I have a website, but there's not really any info there. So awesome, Terrell. Thanks for coming on, man. Really fascinating stuff about Thanks. mushrooms. We haven't had that so. Um, fun show people at home I mean definitely takes the unique card for sure yeah thanks for having me give mushrooms a chance people mushrooms a chance chance. alright yeah